Then he came over to Germany with this Royal Air Force unit, and their responsibility was to um, um, was was to document what the German Luftwaffe had been doing. And then, but he became interested in the partly in the victims and partly in the science, what the German, what, what had been done medically during the war. So he went into an organization. Was this after the war? Or? It was about... Um, he was with the, uh, he was a doctor with the Royal Air Force. Right? It was about July 45. So just as, just about six weeks after the war had ended. Yeah. Um, that unit was stationed near Belsen concentration camp. Yeah. And so I think that John must have gone to Belsen yeah. and seen what was going on yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and that, I imagine, was an enormous turning point for him. Yeah. Must have a shattering experience. Well, I thought that he was, from what, I, what he told me, I know it was always my impression <laughs> Uh, he was one of the three British medical officers that entered the first concentration camp captured by the Allies, which was Bergen-Belsen, right. and that he was overwhelmed, obviously, you know, by what he saw there. And I think he told me that his hair turned white the next day. Gosh, no whether that. I know it turned white. Yes, <laughs> but. Uh, that's how I thought he, I didn't know, I guess that was after the war when they got yes. to Bergen Belsen. Well, so anyway. it'd be interesting to work, to, to, to know the dates, because yeah. I know when this Air Force, if he came, if he went to Germany before the unit arrived, he was at a, for a time in charge of this unit, of, 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 of this, um, it was a group of, it was a unit of Canadians, but was, Seconded oh, to the Royal Air Force. Oh, did you hear that? There was a unit of Canadian. Yeah, it was a Royal Canadian he, Air Force. Because he uh, he enlisted with Canadian Air Force. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then um, the next thing I know, he's working for an organization called Fiat. It's Field Information Technical, and he's run and he's working as a medical intelligence officer, um, documenting. German medical research. And in November 1945, he writes memoranda and reports saying 90% of German medical research was criminal. Wow. And he sends these reports to the British and the American war crimes investigate, the war crimes people. Yeah and to the medical people, places like the Medical Research Council. And he uses for the first time the phrase medical war crime. No one has used that before. And what he does is, and he puts together by constantly writing reports, and he has the idea of having a major meeting, which is held in um, May 1946 on medical war crimes in which the British, the French and the Americans are there and it's American war crimes and medical officers always mm -hmm. it's, it's making that link mm -hmm. and so when they wanted to do a second trial after the big four, after the big four power trial at Nuremberg um, so much material, thanks to John Thompson, had been found that they went ahead and did a medical trial. So the so Nuremberg trial, day. this was after the Nuremberg trial? This was after that, well, what, what happens in the Nuremberg trials is that you get the first big four power Nuremberg medical trial um, with the politicians like um, Goebbels and, um, and then that wasn't big, medical, that was just the Nuremberg trial. That was the big trial of the Nazi political yeah, yeah, leaders. Yeah. And Hess, for example, Rudolf Hess, yeah. whom I think John Thompson also had um, 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 also interviewed. And then the next thing that they have is the Americans 
have a special series of trials for industrialists, lawyers, yeah. um, the, uh, the, these um, SS special forces in the Soviet Union that did yeah. so much to, to kill people. And the first of these was the medical trial. Um, and so it was really thanks. And so he really he got the single handed. Single handed, he made it. Have you been able to hear him, Dan? Yeah, and John was the one who gathered this information yes. and had enough information so that they had a specific medical trial. He had the best files. He did interrogations, collected reports, and he then had it, and he then said it wasn't enough just to prosecute 23 people at Nuremberg. We need to get, we need to document everything the Germans did. So he did this microfilming operation. There was actually the grandson of Sigmund Freud, Clement Freud, was his assistant. Mm -hmm. So it was Keith Mann and Clement Freud and John Thompson, and they microfilmed about 10,000 documents on Nazi war crimes um, for this international science for this international scientific commission, um, and so that was a, uh, so that that's the point where I sort of re reconstructing that and reconstructing his achievement uh, because there's just so much material on that in the archives of, in uh, Washington in the National Archives and in the British Public Record Office, and in France, there was this uh, French psychiatrist, Francois Bale. And he must have known John Thompson well. Mm -hmm. um, and so putting all that material together meant that I um, uh, able to reconstruct the background. So he's crucial, absolutely crucial on that. Mm -hmm. Did you hear him say that John invented the term medical war crime? There? Yeah. Did did he look after survivors of Belsen? Did what? Did he look after the survivors of the Belsen concentration camp? Did he? Look after them. You're asking me? Yeah. He said? That I really honestly don't know. Uh, see, John never talked to Miss Amazing. As close as we were. I never knew any of this about the uh, medical war front. Uh, I mean, I can tell you my relative, but all I knew was that <clears throat> to go back, well, I'll give you just a little bird's eye of mm -hmm. this session. Anyway, I first met John and I was at McLean Hospital in Boston, mental hospital. That was in, I was there from uh, July 36 to July 37. And that's where I first met John. John used to come to McLean from the Harvard Fatigue Lab. He was, he was uh, working in the Harvard, the Harvard Fatigue Lab was a very well-known, outstanding physiological laboratory of Harvard University. And John was working there, oh, I don't know. And he uh, was interested in the capillary circulation and schizophrenics. And he used to come to McLean, I guess, to see patients or to do some studies. And that's where we first met. And uh, then, then when, then in, let's see. And what I knew about John then was, all I knew was, I mean, that he was obviously English, that uh, he was educated, I think, Edinburgh. Now, whether he was born in 
Scotland or in Mexico. He was born in Mexico. Born in Mexico. Definitely right. born in Mexico. Uh, his uh, father, I think, was what, what I gather was general manager or had some important position with Shell Oil Company in Mexico. And uh, then he went to, uh, let's see, uh, then I know that he went to, he went to school, in, at, at medical school, I guess, in Edinburgh. And then he got to, uh, he was teaching physiology, I think at Swarthmore, that's it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was teaching his physiology at Swarthmore. And he left Swarthmore, and I think that's when he came to Boston. Is that right? Or don't you know? Could be. He went from he went from Edinburgh to Madrid. Yeah. To work with there was a famous. Cajal. That's right, Cajal. Cajal. The and famous, famous uh, Nobel Prize winning neuropathologist. That's right, and that was just before. The, the amazing thing is he'd been in. He'd also been in Freiburg in Germany with a pathologist called Ashoff in '32, and I think must have seen the Nazi takeover in '33. Mm. Then he was with Cajal, and that was just before the Spanish Civil War. Oh. So those are two major turning points mm -hmm. in world history, and mm -hmm. he, he was there. there yeah. And then he, he, he completes his studies in Edinburgh and he gets a recommendation to Harvard, to the fatigue laboratory. That's right, yeah. Um, and so there he is in, in, in Boston. He must have known, did you know Leo Alexander? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, Leo was a pathologist at Boston City when yeah. I was there. Uh, how do you know? How'd that name get it? Creepy. Because Leo Alexander did the, uh, well, two reasons. The uh, main reason is that Leo Alexander was the American medical expert at Nuremberg. Leo Alexander was? Yeah. And so that. John Thompson worked in tandem with Leo Alexander. Because they weren't very friendly. Nobody particularly liked Leo Alexander. Is that right? Why not? Well, he was... He's a big, arrogant, fat, overweight, I mean, guy, and, uh, yeah. and uh, his father, he had, Leo Alexander's father was a very famous Viennese nose and throat man who was killed by a paranoid patient. Yeah. And I get Leo Alexander, he came to the Boston City as a neuropathologist working with a guy named Tracy Putnam, who was then, Tracy was then the head of neurosurgery, although he was a, a neuron, he was the head of neurology, although he was a neurosurgeon. And, uh, <coughs> but I didn't know that, uh, that, uh, that John, I never heard anything from John about, uh, Neil Alexander, that was favorable. He gave, Neil Alexander gave John Thompson a book which was the history of the Jews oh. in 1938. And I saw this, um, John Thompson's really? books are uh, still in the Bronx, uh, still in the State Hospital. Yeah. Um, and I saw the book with the dedication. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Um, and it shows that there's this concern with, with, Jews. With, with Jews as what is going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. I think he I had, always had the idea that we were the first Jews that John really knew. Right. That my, my <laughs> wife had. <heard. laughs> well, at any rate, to get back to. And then. Uh, Following, let's see, so I, I met John out there, and I don't know how we became friends, but we became friends, 
and we used to play squash together. And then the next year, in 37, 38, I went back to the Boston City Hospital as chief resident in neurology at the Boston City. That's where Leo Alexander was. And there was a squash court there, and John and I used to play squash together. And uh, then the following year, I went to the Mass General as chief resident of psychiatry. And there we lived in at a small apartment in Cambridge. And, uh, and, we, and we saw each other frequently. And John was uh, very friendly with... Uh, hey, this is my nephew, Jan. Hi, it's good to meet you. Paul, 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 Paul Wenling. Don't let me interrupt. Hmm. There's a chair. Nothing. I'm going to just read through it. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and we, so we used to, we played squash together, we'd go out and eat together. And John, for instance, would go, to an Italian restaurant where he'd order an Italian. I mean, he knew Italian, Spanish, German, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, all, I was, as he got to know us, I was under the impression that we were the first Jews that he really had a relationship with. Now, I didn't know about Daniel Alexander <clears throat> and the book. I didn't know anything about that. And, and then, I'll make this brief and I can tell you a lot of stories. Then, the uh, highlights are that, as, remember this, in 36 there was the Spanish Civil War, and there was a lot of uh, pro-fascist feelings in Boston with a lot of Catholics, and uh, as we became <laughs> closer, and John began to talk about the plight, you know, the anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera, I know that, oh, and, and also as as Hitler was growing in power, he was becoming more and more depressed and upset. And uh, then, to put it very briefly, when you were with John, or you got to know him, he would tell you stories that you would never believe. And at first I wondered, is he a pathological liar, or is he making all this up? But time after time, something would come up to verify these stories. But they were always on the outskirts. They were always, you know, between reality and unreality. And most of them, I said most of them, I think all of them, turn out to be true. And for instance, uh, <coughs> for instance, just to give you one example, uh, he told us a story about a girl he was in love with when he was teaching at, uh, what was it? Swarthmore. Yeah. Swarthmore. Swarthmore. And this young woman, he was teaching physiology, I think, at Swarthmore. And this young woman was a student, and she was a daughter of a very, very famous English professor. I never remember Phelps. I think it was Phelps at Yale very famous professor of English. 
And John said, tells us a story about that they were in love with each other and they separated. I mean, she went back this summer and they were supposed to correspond and then get together. And I think he knew that the family was not against him, but felt that his daughter, their daughter was too young to be seriously involved. And then John tells this story about uh, he never heard from her. She never heard from him. And then only later, and they broke up, only later did he find out, somehow or other, maybe after she was married, I don't know, that uh, her parents interrupted his mail, didn't give her his mail, and never sent her mail. Some, you know, story like that. <coughs> All right, now, <coughs> now it's uh, 1938, and I'm at the Mass General. And John had a little laboratory in one of the old buildings at the Mass General on the fifth floor. And a little time, it's just a closet in turned into a laboratory where he had a drum and he was measuring capillary circulation. And this one morning or afternoon, he was doing this study where he was hooked up to the machine. And uh, people were, and he, he didn't know who was walking down the hall. It might be patients, visitors, doctors, people he knew, people he didn't know. And the idea of that particular study was to see how his capillaries would react to see various people. So I walked down, somebody else walked down. And then suddenly, this, the phenomenometer went off the drum. And who walked down? Could you speak louder, Dad? Gene and I met her. She was her name was Hudson John. What was her name? No. Her Where? married name was Hudson, I think. Joan? Uh, yeah, I think. I don't know if it was Joan, but she was most attractive. And we spent a few evenings together. And what had happened was, <coughs> she never heard from John. She thought it was finished. And it was finished. And they never communicated, never saw each other. And in the course of time, she married a young graduate student at Yale in English, who went out to the University of Colorado in Denver and they were living there, and he got an empire. He got a, a he got an abscess of his lung, and they sent him to the Mass General, because at that time there was a surgeon named Churchill who was the first surgeon who out, who took out a lung. So he was sent to the Mass General, and she was walking down the hall, and that's. And then she verified the whole story. And that was just one story, you know. But, you know, that was typical. That was really typical. And she was still in love with him. But then that, nothing happened. And then, well, then he went through a period. He was in the mental, he had a depression. A serious depression, I don't know. And he was, I, he was hospitalized, I think, at McLean. Is that right? Or don't you know? Definitely. Yeah, I think he was hospitalized. You never told me this. Yeah. But the depression was, I always uh, associated it with Thomas Mann and, you know, the Magic Mountain. Mm. That John had to go through that experience, right. you know. Yeah. He had a, not, 
No, he had TB. He had TB. That I knew. I yeah. know about the TB. TB, yeah. He was had, it, yeah, was it he, depression or TB? He had depression and TB. Okay. Okay. And he was hospitalized for, but you know that, I mean, that was part of his life. I mean, right. he, he had to act out there. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. <laughs> and then, then he was now. Yeah. You know, so this is thirty seven. Did you know someone called William Corwin? Yeah, Bill Corwin. Yeah. What was he? Because John Thompson published with Bill Corwin, and Bill Corwin then. He, John Thompson then left his, um, w w when he went into the services, left all his things behind with William Corwin. So. Yeah, Corwin was a, he was a psychiatrist, wasn't he? I, I don't know. At Walton Hospital. Walter. Walton. Walton Hospital. Walton? Walton Hospital. Uh, Bill Corwin was a psychiatrist. Well, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, this is the most dramatic. <coughs> John was going with a young, very attractive, charming young woman named Margaret Lennox. Margaret Lennox was a daughter of Bill Lennox, who was professor of neurology at Harvard. He was at the Boston City. He was a particularly interested in epilepsy. He was real, wrote a lot. It was well known. And they were, he was very well known, successful, and they had a lovely house and all that. And uh, their daughter, Margaret, went to medical school at Yale. How they met and whatnot, I don't know. But at any rate, they were engaged to be married. And uh, I knew that there were, she was graduating from Yale. Oh, this was in 1938. 19 when, Dad? 38. Okay. And she was going to, and John wanted her to intern in Boston. Now, believe it or not, in 1938, none of the Harvard hospitals took women interns. Imagine, 1938. Now, she could have got into the Boston City or one of the good hospitals through her father, I'm sure. But she refused to do that. <laughs> so I think we knew there were, there were some, they were both in some difficulties. And one night, you know, it was on a Saturday night, that's right. We're living in Cambridge, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, the doorbell rings or somebody's at the door. And I answer, and it's John. It was a cold night, and he had walked all the way from Melton, I don't know, maybe 20 miles or 50, I don't know. Good, good hike from, from the... Uh, <laughs> Lennox is to our house. And he brought him in. And he told us that he and Margaret broke up. That she refused to have her internship in Boston. I remember he had his his jacket on and a what do you call it? You know, turtleneck. Yeah, not a scarf. A scarf. 
you know how the English cavat or something. Yeah, what's it called? Just a, a dinner jacket. Yeah. No, no, no. A no, no, a uh, sport jacket. You know. Yeah, I see it. And and I, uh, what do you call around here? Cravat. Yeah. Cravat. Cravat. So we put him to bed, and I guess around two or so he got up, and he went to he had an apartment on Beacon Hill. And then we got calls from the Lennoxes. Where's John, et cetera, et cetera. And they were worried what happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was that. Well, two weeks later, John invited us to dinner at the Copley Plaza. First time Gene and I had ever been to the Copley Plaza. I remember dinner. We were supposed to meet him at six, and the reason for the dinner was he wanted us to meet his cousin, a young woman from Mexico City. So Gene and I got to the Copley, and John comes out of the dining room. We march into the dining room. John, could you get the phone? Yeah. Thanks. There he introduces us. He said, I want you to meet my wife, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> and mom. John and my wife had a very close relationship. Okay. I mean, he's being interviewed right now. They spent hours together talking. You want to talk to Niels for a second? You want to Who talk to Niels? Niels? I think we got the last slip. Well, we have the last slip. He introduced you to Margaret Lennox, whom you already knew? No. This is, this is to a sister, a Mexican. His wife. This is a new one. I think it's a, her name was Marjorie Simpkins originally. What? Simpkins. I forgot her From name. England. Yeah, from England. Yeah, that's uh, right. So here's what Marjorie happened. Marjorie Simpkins. Margaret. Margaret Simpkins. What right. happened was... What happened was, when John left our house that Sunday afternoon, he cabled or wired Margaret, who had been his girlfriend or mistress or something or other in England, to come over to get married that, af that afternoon. And she arrived two weeks later by boat because she was afraid to fly. John went down to New York, met her. They were married at the Justice of Peace. And then John flew back to Boston and she took the train. That's how their marriage started. And. Uh, you know. What, what was she like? She was a very lovely young woman, bright, attractive, and she worked as an electric, she was a technician in the electroencephalographic laboratory at the Boston City Hospital. And when the guy who ran that laboratory, I forget his name, Hoffer, when he left, he went to Columbia, and she went with him, and then we lost track of her. And they divorced? He and them oh, yeah, they got divorced. How long were they married? Maybe a year, but, you know, I don't know if they were ever together. Well, I'm sure they were. They, she came to his apartment, but, but now, and when we... Then, then I went back to Cincinnati. Oh yeah. Now 
Now, during the, the, those years in Boston, when we knew each other, John became more and more interested in anti-Semitism. And there was a lot going on at that time, and especially in Boston. There was a, a, a Catholic priest who was a right-wing priest who gave sermons or lectures on radio. And John decided that this was an epidemic and it should be tackled scientifically. And I remember, this was before the war, he went to see, and this is typical of John, as you can imagine, he went to see the president of Harvard, I got, whether it was Lowell, I forget who the president was then, to discuss this with the president of Harvard about setting up a center, department, division, whatever you want to call it, to study anti-Semitism. And I guess the president said, well, have you get me a million dollars or something like that. And then he went down to see, what's his name? The, the banker in New York, not Wolberg, uh, Warburg. He went to see Warburg. And I think Warburg said he would give him a million dollars. That would make a contribution to Harvard. And then, but by that time, the war started, or Poland was invaded, and John went to, he was in, he, he was in the hospital for a while for his TB, and then he went up to, he went to Canada to enlist. Uh, uh, now, then, let's see, then during the, we went back to Cincinnati in July of 39. John was with the uh, Royal Air Force, Canadian Royal Air Force. <coughs> and uh, I guess we heard from John off and on. I was in Cincinnati. I remember he came down. Yeah, this was before the war. When did he go? When did he go to join the Royal Air Force? Do you remember? He first of all went to uh, Toronto. To there was um, um, a physiologist called um, Bazet and also Banting and, and Best. Um, um, there was what? There was a, a physio. Um, th there was a, a department at the University of Toronto. Um, where the medical research, where the medical research department was, there was Banting, there was Best, yeah, that, yeah. and there was also um, someone came up from the U.S. called Bazet, Cuthbert Bazet, and he was there from um, I think it was forty to forty-one, and they initially didn't accept him for the Royal oh. Canadian Air Force because of his TB. Yeah. Um, and um, so then, um, so it would have been about 40, but he did come down to the States. Yeah, because he visited missions. us in Cincinnati. Once. There was one that he, I found when I was at Yale, he visited Washington in 43, in about May 43, as a, he came down as a liaison officer. Oh, he hadn't gone abroad. No, no, no. He only, um, I mean, he only went abroad, I think, in, I think it was 45 when he first went. Really? It could have been 44, 45, something Oh, like he that. was with the Royal Station in yeah. Toronto? First in Toronto, then at Halifax. Um, those seem to be in two, two places, Toronto and Halifax. Also, he was at Ottawa. Yeah. Um, and... Um, I met somebody who researched with him. He had a, they were interested in pre-breathing oxygen so that the um, Air Force pilots flying at high altitude with sudden descent shouldn't black out and shouldn't get severe pain. It's called, mm -hmm. called yeah. 
bends. And so John worked out a system. He designed a new helmet for pre-breathing of oxygen, mm -hmm. which you could comfortably pre-breathe for. Um, apparently, you could even sleep in this helmet. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was very successful, his work there. And he was very well respected. Mm -hmm. um, and when he then went down to, the, to Washington, he, he compared the American and the Canadian uh, research on uh, not on oxygen deficiency, yeah. and um, it was clearly a very impressive presentation mm -hmm. because the, then the, um, there's a very sort yeah. of a very positive response yeah. by yeah. these um, um, high-ranking physiologists, yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. That, yeah. Uh, he could certainly impress. People. Yeah, he was a physiologist. He, he must yeah. have been very clear in yeah. his presentation, very clear, very um, direct, uh, really understanding. Yeah. Um, and having a way of putting things across. Because they were both friends, and I don't think uh, John was particularly fond of Arthur. But at any rate... Neither was I. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm the mercy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, during the... I don't know whether we had correspondence. You know, we had a lot of correspondence, but we, we never... We left it in Cincinnati. When did Michael go to see... Well, uh, see what? Uh, in nineteen, yeah, we then I knew then we we corresponded, and uh, I knew that John after the war joined UNESCO, I think. That's right. Yeah. And he was the head of the office in uh, in where was it? In Germany. In Wiesbaden was in, it? In Wiesbaden. Wiesbaden. Yeah, definitely. Did you visit him there? Yeah, we visited him there. Yeah. We visited him in Wiesbaden, and then we went to Oviv. Oh right, yeah. Where he had his his uh, he he brought in refugees. He it was open house. He took over an old chateau. You know this story. Do you remember who owned the chateau? No, I'd love to hear about oh, it. Oh well, that story is. It's important. It is, if I remember correctly. John became pope. John. Oh, the pope John, right? was papal nuncio, nuncio in Paris. And John was converted by... John Thompson was converted to Catholicism by John before he was pope. And, and I remember uh, John bought this place, O.B., with a sort of run-down little chateau outside of Paris. And I think he bought it with help that he got from John, the paper announcement, the paper announcement. What's it? Got some money for him. And he opened this place up as a, and this was after the war, we were there in 51. Uh, people were just wandering around your displaced person. And anybody who came who needed a place, or who managed to stumble on an OB, was taken in. And no questions were asked whether you were a communist, fascist, or whatnot. And then we, John had his own chapel there. He had his own little place and his own chapel. And uh, now John gave us the impression <laughs> that he spent hours and hours with John, the, the non-papal nuncio, talking about the Jewish situation and that he was the one who converted. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. Maybe, you know, uh, Pope John was one of the most liberal of the, as you know. And John always, I think John gave us the impression that he was the one who convinced, and not obviously the guy who became Pope knew something about Jews, but it became highly personalized through John. And, uh, <clears throat> and then in the course, when he was, we visited him when he was at Wiesbaden, and he was the head of UNESCO, and that was, 
before Germany was in the UN, or yeah. And uh, the only hatred I ever heard expressed by John was for Germans. He hated the Germans yeah. with a deep and severe hatred. Hey, hey. He picked up. Hey, hi. Oh. Uh, hey, this is Paul. This is hi. my nephew hey, Eric. Eric. Not nice to meet you. My nephew Neil. Paul Wheeling. Hi. Speak to me, dude. Sorry, say again. The John yes. Thompson. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. We yes. have yes. Uh, yeah. 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 John has just convinced the <laughs> famous Pope John, before he was Pope, the most liberal uh -huh. Pope, to be sympathetic to the Jews. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah? That's well, what Dad's saying. Sounds like a nice. He told Dad. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you want to draw some blood? Yeah, I want to do that one. Like, um, go out. Uh, Paul, we're yeah, also we, inviting you to lunch. And you had lunch. the blood oh, stuff? You had the lab stuff, Grandpa? Can I just hey, <laughs> take this out of your way? Yeah? Like, I, I must have, I don't know when I first knew him, it seemed like, maybe when I was eight or, you know, forever, when he'd come to Cincinnati, which is where we live. And I, he just totally, I mean, I can remember I never met a person like him. You know, my parents' friends were many professors and psychiatrists, but he was interested in reading and the arts and poetry, which even as a little girl, I was. And, um, and I don't know if he influenced me partly to be interested or what, you know, what came first. But uh, the other thing is, he listened to children. You know, he really took an interest in me and my brother. I don't think my sister's much, she was smaller, but uh, he really talked to us and listened to us. And um, when then it was a pleasure, because when we moved to New York, John was in New York, so we got to see him. He would come out to the house a lot. And again, even in New York, he, and he talked about spiritual things, and he talked about religion. He just talked about things that nobody else did in quite the same way that we knew. And my parents, again, knew very sophisticated and intellectual people. Um, and the only thing I can say, I mean, again, I, was, I last saw John when I was, I think, 21. And I was engaged to marry an artist who had had a psychotic decompensation maybe two years before I met him. And my parents didn't want me to marry him when they started finding out certain things about him. And his name was Kent. And Kent and I came to New York, and John wanted to meet him, I think, because John was going to advise my parents, probably, you know. And uh, I remember John saying to me that he could understand why I was in love with Kent. That's all I can remember saying. And he's the only person, because my parents were so scared, you know, that they weren't saying anything particularly nice, but John could see what was special and kind of spiritual about Kent. So they had some connection. Plus, John worked with, I think, schizophrenics. Not that Kent was schizophrenic mm. at that point, but he had um, kind of an otherworldly aspect of his own. But John never said, don't marry him. No, I think he did, actually. I think he did tell me he didn't think it was a good idea. But he also told me that he could see why I loved him. So it was a very... Mm -hmm special way of talking to me that nobody else was, because I was very in love. Um, but I also knew something was wrong with Kent, or else Kent too. It's, it's just we, the house it just came alive. People were riveted when John was in a room. And again, remember there are all these people my parents knew, but people were riveted when he started to talk. I'm sure you've heard this from everybody, haven't you? Well, <laughs> that, I guess many people that's you know, right. Okay. Someone, that's um, all I can say. On a um, and he yeah, talked right. kind of softly, not aggressively or anything. Um, and he listened to other people very well. He wasn't a show off or egocentric. Did he give you guidance on what to read? No, I don't think so. I just would hear him talking about right. this. I don't. He, oh, he, you know, see, now you're making me remember something else. 
when I was applying to college, he wanted me to go to, uh, it's here in New Mexico, St. John's, I think it's called the Classics, where they, do you know about that college? There's only, I think, one or two of them in the United States. And they teach, they make you read all the classics the first two years. No sociology, you know, it's like you read just, and you have to learn Latin and Greek completely. And it was a little too intense for me. I think he was disappointed that I didn't go there. That's where he wanted me to go. It's funny, you do remember more things, isn't it? Yes. Did you talk about um, um, culture, theater, ballet, anything? All the time, yeah, everything. Ballet. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. But I can't remember anything. Can't remember anything. I'm so anything. sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. You know, I brought. Did you know about this yeah, organ? Yeah, Grandpa. You know where the. I only just read it on the way there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me show you. He actually got me a book. He got me a book of poetry by Auden that he had Auden signed for me. Oh, right. okay. But I didn't have it. I gave it to somebody. Oh. Unfortunately. It would be a wonderful thing. I gift. know. Because this book, The Age of Anxiety, so uh -huh. he is a key figure in the poem. You're kidding me. Yeah. He is, look, it says... Um, What's that? You going to see Harry Potter? I'd like to see a movie, but this guy can't really go. This person made it. Because uh -huh. there's that four figures. Well, I'll go with you. And it's a just <laughs> dead from <laughs> Malin. Uh, it's a Canadian <laughs> actor. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. And this yeah. poem, it won the Pulitzer Prize. You are kidding. Oh, you've got to tell us my father. And Leonard Bernstein. Can Charlie go see a movie? He wrote yeah, the right. second yeah, symphony. Yeah, it's the, the, called The Age of Oh my goodness. Two and a half hours in front of the movie. In a way, it's obviously. In full of songs. In the symphony of Bernstein. A fool, I know you would have known that. Right, right. I mean, I don't know. You could ask Dad, I know. But it sounds like John. It's quite a different, I found, I mean, I read it on the way down, and I, I found it quite a difficult poem, uh -huh. but there's some, yeah, there's some words there, but the fact right. that he gave you, what, this wasn't what he gave you for Morden, because that would have been... No, it was a book of Morden's poem that he gave me. But you know, John also was kind of um, secretive, isn't the word, I mean, again, yes. I was only, but he never, like, I didn't know he had sisters or mm. brothers, it was, he made, I I always thought we were his family. You know, I thought that that's how he looked at us, and that he was an orphan or something, because he never talked about anybody. Didn't. No. No, he might tell stories about mm -hmm. people and things, and he talked about books, but it was kind of like like he was an uncle, or you know, he'd come for Sunday brunch and. He had a couple of brothers uh -huh. and a sister. Uh -huh. I learned that from Dad just yesterday. Yeah. No, he yeah. never talked about his no, family. No, let me look. Now he might have to my father, but to us it was like... This is his obituary from the New York Times. Oh, my God. And it mentions Margaret and then Philip of Mexico. To, these are the... That's his... He went to see Freud, I know. In Vienna. Uh, Steve Bauer thought that um, he was analyzed, that he made that that he knew um, Jones in London. I don't know if he was analyzed or not. Yeah. You think he was analyzed? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, if he was, it was just for the experience, not for you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, I mean, you wouldn't say he was a Freudian from no, the point, no. No, no. No, uh, just uh, for get the highlights of this. So. We were talking about Oviv. Yeah, we, we went to France in 51, my wife and I, and went to Oviv to visit John. It was quite an experience. You know, this chapel it turned white. I hadn't seen him, you know. Hmm. And, uh, I went to uh, Wiesbaden, and uh, then, then the next I knew was, and I think my son Michael also visited him in uh, Oviv. But then I went, then 19, oh yeah, in 1953, 
I was invited to go to Israel to start the Department of Psychiatry in Jerusalem. So I went there for the summer, and then we, 54, 55, we lived there for a year, and I started the department. And uh, one of the men came back. Before I left the States in 54, I was offered the job as chairman at Einstein. That was a new medical school. And uh, actually, I know I, was, uh, I am bragging, I guess. I was proud to offer every chairmanship in the country at that time. Almost, not everyone, almost. But I didn't want to leave Cincinnati. But when I went to Israel, that was my first break from Cincinnati. And uh, the reason I guess I took the Einstein job was I got hooked on Judaism, but you know, through my experience in Israel. And, uh, and then and then I, would, I corresponded with John, and then he told me he got fed up with UNESCO. And he left, I don't know, in 55 or 54, yes. something like that. And he went to Oxford, and he was working in a child psychiatric clinic. Yes. And I guess it was, way of, I don't know when it was, 56 or 57. I wrote to John, and I invited John to come to Einstein. And uh, I didn't invite him to Einstein because I thought he would contribute a great deal as a psychiatrist. I didn't think he was that special as a psychiatrist, but as a person. I just wanted him around. I wanted, mm. and he developed the following. He, he was like, a, you know, he was a charismatic person, and he had his followers. Stephen, what's his name? Was one of them. Steve Bauer, yeah. Bauer, yeah. He had a, a whole group of them. Who else? Oh, I don't know. Who else? Well, I've heard the name Sibylla Escalona oh, mentioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but no. But she <laughs> wasn't a follower. Oh, no, no, Sybil. They didn't have anything in common, Sybil. How do you know about Sybil Escalona? How did her name come But up? wait, let's not get diverted on Sybil. Oh, okay. But, uh, so what, I didn't really give John any assignments. I got a salary. I let him do whatever he wanted. And he just, he just met with the young doctors. He had a practice of his own, but he was always involved with very strange events and strange people, strange happenings. I mean, he would go to the prison to see patients, the jails to see patients. Oh, Dad, this, how about the story of the patient who never talked that he stayed with every day for... No, that wasn't John. That was John White. No, no that wasn't John Thompson. Uh, Are you sure? Yeah. He... Uh, what did what did Steve have to say? Um, he remembered very well the hallucination group that John led. Yes, um, and how significant and important that was, um, and felt that John had interesting views on schizophrenia and was actually very good with um, patients. Yeah. With patients, yeah. um, he did mention a patient who was, um, for example, in a severe sort of catatonic state and so That's on. That's the one I'm John just watched him and watched him and then after a while lifted his arm and that lifting of the arm was the beginning of the patient's rehabilitation mm -hmm. um, and wondered whether John Thompson's view that there was perhaps emotional deprivation was a very important factor in the origins of schizophrenia yeah, whether that wasn't anything to do whether he wasn't really talking about himself so. Well, I think John had a, another idea, which I think was correct. Uh, I think he compared it to hibernation. Uh, I mean, that is that the physiology, the schizophrenic, that behavior was to protect himself from getting involved in the world. They didn't have the physiological capacity to adapt to changing situations. But, uh, but uh, John was deeply spiritual. I told you he became a Catholic. And he would, we lived out in Larchmont, and almost every weekend, John would spend the weekend with us, go to church on Sunday morning for Mass. And I teased him about it, but he said uh, he went for the spiritual side of it. And we really didn't discuss much in the way of religion, because didn't have much to discuss. Dad, tell Paul about his relationship with Barry Bandler. Well, this was a patient, I'm very, Barry Brandon was the son of a professor of psychiatry at Harvard, and uh, 
From Cincinnati. From Cincinnati. And, uh, He's still alive, Barry. Yeah, yeah. Call him up right every day. And John started, he was schizophrenic, and John started uh, to treat him. He was an artist. He, no, John Barry made Barry was an artist. John uh, made him an oh, artist? Oh, yeah, he was an artist. Oh. John encouraged him to draw and he became a very, you know, he, he was very talented. No, John encouraged that. Oh, I didn't know that. And then who was the guy in... Hi. Mary. Yeah. Oh, was it this cheese or the one that we bought? The ones you bought. But, uh, okay, yeah, the one. See, I really didn't know much about what John actually did in the department. He had his own, I, I let him loose. By that I mean is, what I wanted, the reason I wanted John was, I wanted him, I wanted the residents to get to know him. I wanted him to know the residents, and whatever happened, you know. It wasn't to teach anything specific, but just to associate with him. And, uh, and I knew they would be influenced by him. But uh, you appointed him as assistant professor. I forget what it was. Yeah. I forget what it was. Yeah. It just struck me that someone with all his experience coming as assistant professor is that Well, you see, he had no bibliography. Yeah, that was his thing. He didn't, and, uh, didn't never publish. <laughs> and, uh, you know, too, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been appointed, I doubt, of any other place on the basis of his work. Mm. But if this was high, this was personal. So I say, I wanted him in the department as a person, personality, as someone who would have an influence, bring the human spiritual touch into the situation. Mm. That was uh, very important. Yeah. Because psychiatry at that time, I mean, there was a whole new range of scientific approaches coming in, um, particularly drug therapies and yeah, so that's that right. was not. So yeah. John would have been a sort of very different. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Paul, do you want Dad to tell you about his finding the orphans? Yes. The orphans John found. How that happened in Germany. You know how he was riding along. Well, I don't think I was right. I think. Uh, Seb Littman, did you ever get in touch with Marie Odette? Did I did, yes, did. and I've been in touch with Sebastian Littman's brother. Oh, I see. Well, who, where is he? He's in, um, he's in Germany, in a place called Heidenheim. He stayed in Germany. Um, what does he do? I think he went into some, he did some sort of electronics work. I see. Um, <laughs> what he said was, was that his brother Sebastian Littman was apprenticed to be a baker, I think. Now, is he older or younger? I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's always a brother and a sister mm -hmm. as well. Um... I think the story was that there was a, uh, the American Army set up some sort of a center for adolescents, or young kids who were just wandering around. And that's where Sebastian was. And I think John picked him up there. And if I remember, I think he told me that Sebastian's father had been a judge who was uh, who was uh, killed by the Nazis. He was anti-Nazi. wasn't Jewish. Not Jewish, no, right. And they were from Eastern Germany. Oh, from East Germany? Yeah, they were from an uh, area which is now Poland. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. And, uh, judge, okay. I think there were three or four or five yeah. young men that John had picked up and sort of adopted either semi-officially or officially. But I know with Sebastian, he, tra he educated him, I mean, at Edinburgh. And, uh, so he would have met them when? In 47, 48, or? You mean at the... Uh, yeah, at the Army Center. I guess, uh, I guess that was when John was at Beesbach. In Beesbach, And he was right. traveling around. He was in charge of UNESCO. Mm. When he was at UNESCO yeah, already, when he was right? at UNESCO. Do you know the name of any other of the? I forgot. I, I'm, I'm Maria Odette must know. And I, I must get back in touch with her. And they remained in Germany. The others? Or, no, I no. think one of them. I thought one of them came here. I forget. Honestly. Okay. So these these children whom he adopted were separate from the Oviv. Um, Psychotic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, there's another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, now, John actually led two lives, maybe more than two lives. As as close as we were, as much time as we spent together, 
Gene, my wife and I, we visited his apartment only once. Only once did he ever invite us to his apartment in New York, only once. And uh, my guess is that he led a homosexual life as well as uh, he was bisexual. But I think in his later years, it was mainly homosexual. I mean, I'm not saying I don't say there was a relationship with Auden, but you know, Auden was at the memorial service that we held for John and almost a Stephen Spender. He didn't like Stephen Spender. Uh, really, John Thompson didn't like Spender? I don't think so. Oh, I see, okay.